This is Michael Altos recording Neuromuscular Blocking Agents and Reversal Drugs, Part 1. Before we talk about these drugs, we should take a moment and review the physiology of the neuromuscular junction. This is the narrow gap that exists between the neuron, the nerve cell, and the muscle fiber. And what happens is the nerve depolarizes. This is how a charge comes down the long nerve cell by the uh, depolarization of the membrane potentials generated by ions. And as the nerve depolarizes, calcium ions enter into the neuron, and this causes acetylcholine to be released from vesicles that store the acetylcholine inside the nerve. The acetylcholine is released into the neuromuscular junction, and it binds to nicotinic cholinergic receptors that are on the motor end plate of the muscle fiber. When acetylcholine binds to the receptor, it opens up an ion channel, and this generates what's called an end plate potential. So the charge continues in the muscle fiber. And this potential propagates along the muscle membrane, and this causes the muscle to contract. I should remind you that the amount of acetylcholine you need is only a fraction of the amount that's actually released. Probably about 10 times as much acetylcholine is released as you actually need in order to achieve depolarization of the cells. And this diagram here shows everything I've just described. Here's the nerve cell, the neuron, surrounded by a myelin sheath. This is the axon. And at the end of the axon is the axon terminal. And this is the end of the nerve cell. Over here is the muscle cell. And the space between them is the neuromuscular junction. And this part of the muscle cell is called the motor end plate. Here we have vesicles filled with acetylcholine at the uh, axon terminal of the neuron. And as the action potential comes down this membrane, calcium rushes in. The calcium causes acetylcholine to be released into the neuromuscular junction. On the motor end plate, on the muscle cell, are acetylcholine receptors. And when acetylcholine binds to these receptors, it causes the motor end plate to generate a, a potential. And this action potential propagates along the length of the muscle fiber. And here you can see on a microscope, this is an actual muscle cell. It looks like a piece of meat. It's muscle. And these tiny little threads are actually axon terminals. They're pieces of nerve coming down to innervate the motor end plate and the muscle fiber. Once the acetylcholine has done its job and is released from the acetylcholine receptor, it's hydrolyzed into acetate and choline by an enzyme called acetylcholine esterase. This enzyme is actually embedded also in the motor end plate membrane. It's right there to catch the acetylcholine when it's released from the uh, receptor. At that point, the acetylcholine receptors close, the end plate repolarizes, and the muscle relaxes. And back to our diagram, here you can see in blue these little guys are acetylcholine esterase enzymes. And so as acetylcholine is released from its receptor, it's found by these enzymes and it becomes hydrolyzed. If you have any questions about this process, you should take a moment and clarify them because understanding the neuromuscular junction is very important as we discuss these different pharmacologic agents. The next thing we should discuss is the technique of peripheral nerve stimulation or using a twitch monitor. This is something we use regularly for neuromuscular monitoring, as you know. And the principle behind peripheral nerve stimulation is the idea of fade. Fade effect occurs when a um, neuromuscular junction is repeatedly or prolongedly stimulated. And over time, we start to see a decrease in the response. And this happens as acetylcholine available in the nerve terminal starts to decrease. This is most, off, most obvious if you provide like a sustained tetanus, five seconds of sustained tetanus, you may start to see fade um, as the muscle, as the neuromuscular junction becomes blocked. The thing you're most familiar with is probably a train of four. A train of four is usually defined as four twitches that are given over two seconds. That's two twitches per second or two hertz. And it can be done every roughly 10 to 20 seconds. You shouldn't do it more frequently than that. And we'll see why in just a few moments. And what we're really trying to do is quantify the train of four ratio. 
which would be the intensity of twitch number four compared to twitch number one. So here's a train of four in a normal patient who hasn't gotten any neuromuscular blockade, and all four twitches are the same intensity. And so the train of four ratio, this intensity compared to this intensity is one. Tetany, or tetanic stimulation, is a very rapid stimulus of 50 to 100 hertz, and it lasts for anywhere from one to five seconds. It just depends on how long you hold down the button. And so we usually uh, denote that with a series of very rapid twitches, but it's so rapid it just looks like a continuous stimulus. Something we don't see very often, but some stimulators have it, is a double burst stimulation. And this is usually two short bursts of tetanic stimulation, about 750 milliseconds apart, and you would look at the ratio of the intensity of the second burst compared to the first burst. This might actually be the most sensitive for detecting fade, but for some reason we don't really do it very often clinically. And then finally, there's a principle called post-tetanic potentiation, or post-tetanic stimulation. The idea is you give tetany for five seconds, and then you do a twitch again, three seconds later. And that shows it here in a normal person, you give them a twitch, and then you do tetany, and then you try another twitch, and the second twitch will be more intense than the first twitch. Sometimes we'll do this when a patient has very profound neuromuscular blockade, just to see if we can get any twitch out of them with this stimulus. And it's because you build up calcium in the presynaptic terminal, and the effect of a tetanus can actually persist for five to 10 minutes. So if you give somebody tetanus, the validity of your train of four after that may be in question for the next several minutes. Now, when we talk about neuromuscular blocking agents, or NMBAs, these are quaternary ammonium compounds, which means they are charged, and they have an affinity for specifically the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. There are two kinds of neuromuscular blocking agents. There are depolarizing agents. They actually look an awful lot like acetylcholine itself, and they bind to the acetylcholine receptors. They are agonists, just like acetylcholine is an agonist. And as an agonist, they generate a muscle action potential but they are not metabolized by acetylcholinesterase. And so they will hang around in the neuromuscular junction much longer than acetylcholine does. The kind of blockade that depolarizing agents cause is called a phase one block. The acetylcholine binds to the receptor. It generates the muscle action potential, which we see as a fasciculation, and then the muscle becomes flaccid and becomes paralyzed. If you do peripheral nerve stimulation in this instance, you will see all twitches decreased in intensity, but no fade. All twitches will be the same intensity, just less intense, and post-tetanic potentiation is absent. We'll see this in the diagram in just a moment. There is something called phase two block, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. This is usually due to prolonged exposure to succinylcholine and it causes an abnormal response to acetylcholine. And we'll talk about that shortly. It actually looks a lot like the blockade caused by a non-depolarizing agent. So let's talk about non-depolarizing agents. The non-depolarizers bind to the acetylcholine receptors, but they don't induce opening. So they're really antagonists, and specifically they are competitive antagonists. They bind to the receptor, and they prevent acetylcholine from binding, but they don't activate the receptor themselves. So there's no end plate potential generated. You don't see a fasciculation. You just block the muscle from being activated by acetylcholine. You've probably heard people say that you could have up to 70% blockade of your neuromuscular junction receptors before you see any fade on the twitch monitor. So people could have four strong twitches and have more than 70% of their receptors blocked. And in fact, you probably need about 90% of your receptors blocked before you have complete twitch suppression. Here's the diagram that shows how we use the peripheral nerve monitor in all of these instances. Here's the train of four, four strong twitches in a normal person. If we give them succinylcholine, they will have four equal twitches, but they will be diminished in intensity. If you give them enough, they'll have no twitches. And the twi as the twitches come back, as the succinylcholine wears off, 
all four twitches will come back with the same intensity. Compare this to the non-depolarizer, where you see fade, where they'll have the first twitch stronger, but each twitch gets weaker, and if they only if and if it if the dose is high enough, the fourth twitch may be so so, so diminished that it's gone, and then they only have three twitches or two twitches, and so on. Tetany shows the same thing. Here's normal tetany. Here's tetany after succinylcholine, and here's tetany after a non-depolarizer. And we see the same with double burst. And finally, the post-tetanic potentiation in a normal person. Whoops. In a normal person. Here it is in a phase two blockade or a non-depolarizing block. Again, with post-tetanic potentiation. But in phase one block, there is no potentiation. I just want to say now, and I'm sure I'll say it again, phase two block and phase one block are unique to depolarizing agents like succinylcholine. The block of a non-depolarizer is not called phase two block. That would be incorrect, even though it looks identical on the peripheral nerve twitch monitor. And finally, just as an overview for now, we can reverse some of our non-depolarizing, we can reverse some of our neuromuscular blocking agents, specifically um, the depolarizing agents reverse themselves. They diffuse away from the neuromuscular junction and they get hydrolyzed, remember, not by acetylcholinesterase, but by plasma pseudocholinesterase. And so there is no reversal agent for phase one block. It happens on its own. And in fact, if you tried to give a reversal agent, like, neostig like a neostigmine, our acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, it could actually lead to a prolonged depolarization. So you wouldn't want to try that. If a patient does go into phase two block, which is rare, and again, we'll talk about this shortly, you may be able to reverse that with acetylcholine, but it's not reliable. So usually when we talk about reversal, we're talking about the non-depolarizing agents. These drugs will eventually reverse themselves, but they have to diffuse away from the acetylcholine receptor. They need to redistribute throughout the body and be metabolized and excreted, and this can take a long time. But if we inhibit acetylcholinesterase, we'll actually increase the amount of acetylcholine in the neuromuscular junction and will eventually increase it so much that it will compete with the neuromuscular blocking drug because it's a competitive antagonist and we can regain the patient's neuromuscular strength. We're going to stop here. If you have questions, you're certainly welcome to contact me or bring them to class and we'll pick up with the next section in the next video.